screens. That font should be big enough. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Jacinta. Morning. Morning. Good morning. I hope you've had a fabulous conference so far and that you've been at least getting enough sleep in between the days. <laughs> maybe not, so maybe not enough, but enough to at least be awake during my tutorial. <laughs> Now, you might have noticed if you've gone and downloaded everything like I asked you to, you might have noticed that I've given you a PDF with almost 80 pages in it. I can't cover that much material in 90 minutes. Aww. A whole page a minute is just not going to happen. This is a hands-on tutorial. So what you're going to find is that I'm going to cover roughly half of most chapters till about halfway through the book, and then I'm going to say the rest is for your reading. This is material from Pearl Training Australia's course that we're putting together, which will be eventually called Enterprise Pearl. We've given it in various shorter forms of two or three days. It will eventually be a five-day course. And I've just decided that it would be much better to give you lots of material that you can go back and learn more about from than to constrict you to just a bunch of slides, but particularly to give you a good learning experience. So feel free to read the rest. There will be points where I'll go, okay, now on to the next chapter, even though we've only gone one third or halfway through the chapter we're currently looking at. Hopefully we'll all get to the practical exercise by about three, two thirds, halfway to two thirds way through the exercise, uh, through this period of time. I think my timing's good enough. We should be able to do that. And then once we're, we're there, we'll spend probably most of the rest of the remaining time on the practical exercise. But if we should have extra time, that's when we'll hit the second half of the manual. So that's the plan. Please don't, actually it's up to you. My preference would be that you don't spend the entire time reading the rest of the chapter rather than trying the practical exercises. But if you'd rather read the rest of the chapter than try the practical exercises, I'm certainly not gonna stop you. If your laptop doesn't work, if you don't have a module that isn't that you need to have installed, most of these exercises do not carry on from the previous. So you may be able to get by anyway. But otherwise, a pen and paper to try out your solution will be fine as well. Okay, so chapter two. Chapter, all the stuff prior to chapter two is pretty much just headers. So we can skip those. Installing from the CPAN. Now I'm actually going to slightly bypass this and draw on the whiteboard for a moment. If you have a operating system with a decent package manager and you can install using that package manager because you have appropriate privileges, use your package manager. So most of the modules that I've installed on this machine Most of the modules have been installed by doing that. sudo apt-get install lib whatever minus whatever minus Perl. I don't need the latest and greatest. If you need the latest and greatest, you probably will need to install from CPAN. But if you can do this, I strongly recommend using your operating system's package system if you can. Of course, if you are using an ancient version of your operating system, it might have stable in its name. <laughs> <laughs> you may find that you need to install from CPAN in order to have something that actually works and works the way you want it to. But otherwise, this is a great great method and I'm not nothing in this chapter is supposed to suggest that you shouldn't do that. Okay. Now you've all heard that CPAN is awesome. CPAN is awesome. And this is how how we could install a bunch of things. Now a very small aside Pearl Brew. Sometimes the version of Pearl that you have access to on your machine is not the version of Pearl you want to have access to. Now this might be for a number of reasons. The version of Pearl on your machine may be too new. You may be wanting to, to test your code against an ancient version of Pearl that is 11 years old. But you don't want to install an 11 year old version of Pearl onto your system. You just want to have access to it. Or well, you don't want to install it system-wide, I mean. Or uh, the more common situation, the version on your Perl, version of Perl on your system is too old and you want to upgrade. There's this wonderful tool called Perl Brew that allows you to do that. If you do not have super user permissions, Perl Brew is very easy to install anyway. 
and you can read the man page for how to do so. But unfortunately, if you're, not, if you're using Windows, you're out of luck. But you install it, you can create the files in your home directory, and then it will take a while. You can have whichever version of Perl you want, all of them if you need. So you can do lots of testing. So I'm not going to cover actually doing stuff with Perlbury. This is a, hey, if you haven't heard about it, Perlbury is awesome. Local lib, hand, hands up if you've heard about local lib. OK, since that's not all of you, I have to tell you anyway. Otherwise, I just move on. Local lib, local lib allows you to say, I want to be able to stall, install my modules locally. So I want to be able to have them in my home directory my full tree of modules and use those ones in preference to the ones in the system, which allows you to upgrade your modules without having to upgrade your operating system, which may be outside your control. Again, if you do not have super user access to your machine, installing local lib is still easy. And you can just read the documentation on CPAN for how to do that. Primarily what local lib does is it creates a whole bunch of uh, environment variables for you to export to your environment. And it says, look here for my files. And that's essentially all it does. It actually says, and if you're building files, put them here as well. Local lib works beautifully with Perlbrew. So you can have all of your local libs for all of your different versions of Perl. Because as you may be aware, major version changes in Perl have typically meant recompiling all of your modules. So you can't necessarily try to use, in fact, you almost certainly can't succeed in using a module compiled for 5.6 with a, a version of Perl 5 that starts with 5.10 or 5.12 or even 5.8. Yes? The line with Perl and uh, local lib at the bottom of the page there. This one? What is the significance of running that and not having anything come back? As in, if you run that and nothing happens? Yeah. That means we're going It's waiting for the actual program. No. No? Wait. No, oh, I'm wrong. You should be able to run local with just like that, and it should give you a bunch of environment variables. Oh, oh, oh OK. I'm wrong. Yeah, which is, which is here what you would say to your YRC file. Um, gotcha. There's nothing That's what it should do. Yeah. Yeah, mine doesn't. The author of Local Lib is at this conference. <laughs> um, if you can find Matt Trout and ask him, he'll be able to answer that question. I have, I did not even know that it couldn't return stuff. Um, I honestly have no idea why it would not be behaving itself. Um, that is an check, excellent question. Yeah, I would check something like uh, Perl 5 Ops as well, because if you've got Perl 5 Ops in your environment, that's it, and I'm loading other stuff or I'm doing other things, maybe it's going to be confused by that. But that's just a guess. But if you find out, I'd love to know. Okay, so now you, if you wish to use local lib but not change your environment or you do not have permission to change your environment or changing your envi environment has other consequences, inside your code you can also just say use local lib and it will settle the environment, inf make all the changes to your environment at that point. So you say use local lib and then you say use whatever module I want and it will check through your local lib module directories first, and then your systems. If you want to see what the environment variables are, that's what, how you would do it. And as I showed down here, that's what it would return. You can usually just take what it spits out there and jump to the very bottom of your recorded commands file. So if you use bash, it'll be .bashrc. If you use TCH, it'll be .tchrc. And if you use other shells, then you do that. If you use Windows, there is a way to do it, but you need to use another module, apt local lib win32 helper, to make the changes to the registry. And since I, I am terrified of making changes to the registry permanently, I do not have a tremendous amount of experience with that, but it works quite well and saves you from having to try to work out how to do that by yourself. Any questions about that? Yes? What's the difference between use local lib and use lib GW? 
Excellent question. Okay, just for the for the uh, recording, the difference. What is the difference between use local lib and specifying a use lib path yourself? Use local lib says I have this Perl module directory tree starting from over here, and whatever it is said in its environment variables. When you say use lib and you pass in a path yourself, you're saying a module can be found right here. It's not a Perl module tree. It's specifically in this directory. Please look in there for ex extra files. And you can do both. So it is perfectly OK to write. That's going to be a terrible idea, isn't it? So you could say use local lib. And you could say use lib and over here, use module. And it will look for module A originally in the end over here directories or directory. And if it doesn't find it there, it will then look into whatever use local lib has set. And if it doesn't find it there, it will then look into whatever else is in at ic. If you want to say, so you, local lib by default assumes that you want to store things in Perl 5 in your home directory. If you don't want to do that, you could say, use local, my team does, for example. And then that would be the default place, and it would set all those environment variables with respect to that location there. If you have made the changes, to your environment by putting them in your recorded commands file, you do not need to say use local lib at all. That will automatically happen. Unless, of course, you have taint turned on. Excellent. CPAN M is the way that I would recommend, if you're not doing this, the way I would recommend you install modules. CPAN M is very, very good and it's very, very quiet. If, it, if you hit dependencies, it's going to say, hey, instead of stopping and wait, interrupting your coffee break, did you really want to send to, to, to these ones as well? It makes intelligent guesses. It says, of course, you need the dependencies. And maybe you want some of the optional ones as well. To install a module with cpanm, which, again, does not come standard with Perl, but is very easy to install from reading the documentation, you'd write that, cpanm followed by the module name. And it knows about local lib. So you can say, if it, you've got your environment variables set, it will go and put your module where those environment variables are set to. If you have, if you don't have your environment variables set, you can say cpanm minus minus local lib, and it'll go right, and it will put those modules in that in your private directory tree. And if you need, actually want to install system-wide, you can use the minus minus sudo switch to move it to system. It'll, it'll ask for uh, your sudo password when it's about to do the install. OK, I'm going to go in the, the wild hope that you've all got these things installed, I'm going to encourage you, if you've got cpanm installed, to install IPC System Simple. Give you just a couple of moments. If you don't have it installed, that's fine, but I'm just giving you a chance to play with what we've covered. Just give you a couple of minutes and then we'll move on. <coughs> If you actually followed the list, you probably had IPC System Simple already installed, so feel free to install something else if if that's the case. Or, in fact, just go, yes, see, it worked, even though you didn't successfully install anything because you didn't need to. That's okay, too. Right. Oh. 
to the justice of the exercise. Yep, no worries. I wonder if they'll splice these bits out of the ex uh, out of the uh, video. It's very boring watching me just sit around and wait for you guys to do this, <laughs> just for the what the viewer. Maybe I should like read prose and poetry in the in the exercise periods. You know when it's time to fast forward the video when you hear the speaker chime like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's not going to hit the video. They're not going to hear that. Yeah. They're just going to hear me, me me smile and everyone laugh. <laughs> yeah, that's the best part of videos. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Does anyone need any help with that, or shall I move on? I'm going to move on. There's lots of exciting stuff to cover. Now, packaging and unpacking with PAR. Sometimes you will wish to give a client something that just works and doesn't have dependency hell. You know, just occasionally that might be a, 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 a friendly desire on your behalf. Now, there are a couple of ways of approaching this. If everything you want to give them is pure pearl, then it is easier than if you want to give them stuff that needs compilation. That should be self-evident. PAR helps you with the situation where things may need compilation. Anything that uses excess, anything that, you, that requires C code, PAR can help you with. If you do have pure Perl, it's the wrong direction. If you do have pure Perl modules that you wish to distribute, app Fat Packer may actually be a better solution. This is not mentioned in the notes because I was only reminded of it once the conference started and I was having a chat with Matt Trout about this. But App Fat Packer, despite the anemic nature of its documentation, is a great way of packing up your script and all of the pure Perl modules it wants into a single file that someone can then just go and, and mash the button on and it will work. So you may want to write that down as something to consider for the, uh, as an alternative. But App Fat Packer does the very simple situation of I have pure Perl modules and a script, and I want to give them to a client and have it just work. Question? Yes. Can PAR handle external dependencies? Can you pack a different C library with PAR? No. Yes. Apparently so. Yes, <laughs> because that's what I did with Sweeperbot. So I wrote myself a Minesweeper bot. I was playing a lot of Minesweeper on Windows, and I didn't want to spend so much time playing Minesweeper. Oh. For the purpose of the video, please come up to oh, the oh, okay. microphone. Oh, <laughs> and also, I ask the question. OK. So the question was, can you uh, use PAR to pack external dependencies, like uh, shared objects, for example, C libraries, that sort of stuff? The answer is yes, you can. Um, I've done that. I've written a Minesweeper bot for Windows, and it needs to include like image magic and a whole bunch of like screen recognition URLs and uh, screen recognition libraries and all these other sorts of things. You can do it. You, there's additional command lines which you have to put on to say, and include this, and include this, and include this. But you can pack anything you want into a PAR file, and then those are accessible, including things like configuration if you want. Um, if you want to do that, uh, app double colon sweeper bot on the CPAN uh, is the uh, the sweeper bot module which I've got. Even if you're not like playing Minesweeper, um, it's got examples in there of how to do all of that. Um, I also wrote an article for um, the Pearl Review, one of the Pearlish magazine things, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so you can, yeah, yeah, great. Um, so you can look that up as well. Yeah, okay, cool. Anyway, have fun with your conference. <laughs> Thank you. And there was a question up the back as well. Uh, yeah, I had a question uh, integrating local lib and mini-sleeper. Yes. Uh, and mini-sleeper and minus flag. So you got to put your uh, local lib exports in your back as uh, you said, right? Uh, so my mirror, uh, which is my local mirror, <coughs> mini-sleeper, that, should that go before the local lib configuration in bash RC or should it be after? What an excellent question. Are you using mini CPAN to do your mirroring? Right, which is a local mirror on my... You know, but there is a, specifically there's a 
another tool called Mini CPAN that allows you to do your mirrors. Are you using that? Yes. Excellent. For the purposes of CPAN M, CPAN minus, it actually loves you being able to specify my mirror is over here. And it will either read it from the, the environment, as you, you're saying, or you can pass it in as a command line option, minus minus mirror equals this place over here. The As long as the changes do not conflict, it doesn't matter which order you put them in. I can't remember off the top of my head whether they do. You may actually need to, to appropriately edit it to make sure that things get set correctly, but I believe that they should not conflict, so it should be okay either way. Hopefully it wouldn't matter whether you put them first or second. Right, now, back to par. Now, to create a par file, the really, really simple version, you just zip a bunch of stuff together. It just uses zip. But I've already told you what a par file is. Paul sort of covered it. A par file is a Perl archive, like a, tar, a tape archive for TARS and a Java archive for JARS. A par file is just a Perl archive. And in this case, as you can see, it's just a bunch of things that have been zipped up together. You provide that, and there's a few extra tools to make it easy to access and pull things out and play with them. To use them, we say use par, and the user will have to have par installed on their system if they're doing it this way. You say use par, and you pass it in the par file. And par knows about how to access the zip file and all the contents therein. And then you use a module, and Perl will look in at ink for where it should find that module. And if the par file is the last use or use lib or use local lib kind of statement you have, it'll be the first place it looks in at ink. And so it'll look in that mod in the par first. And then it, then later it'll look in the rest of at ink if it doesn't find it there. So it's still okay to use your core files. If you have a lot of par files, you can in include all of them by passing in the pattern like this. So you can use glob matches and, and similar to that. Par module has very few dependencies, so it's very easy to install. This is fabulous if the person you are distributing code to, or the machine specifically that you're distributing code to, is using the same operating system and version of Perl that you are. If, if the, that is the case, and you can reliably assume that they're also using the same version of, the, of a C compiler than, as you were, mm -hmm. then you can actually just go ahead and include excess modules this way, and it will work. And it's nice and easy to zip it up, pass it around, it's great. Come back to those exercises in a moment. Creating a par file. We may uh, wish to include more, ex we may want to be a little bit more complicated and take advantage of other things. So if you wish to include all of your dependencies, that par can work out. <coughs> and if you conditionally include things or build up the string and then pass it to require, par is not amazing and uh, mind, mind reading. It will only determine the dependencies that are obvious from reading your code. So you have to be a little bit uh, friendly in that regard. But you can install parpacker, and parpacker will actually go and collect all the dependencies and archive those as well. So then you would say pp for parpacker, um, and then pass in the name of the par you want to create and the name of the script you want it to use, and it would build all of those things together. Ah, look. There's a bug. Oh, yes. I'll fix that. <laughs> Thank you. This now will create, contain our original program, and the user can, can invoke that if they do not wish to unzip the par themselves. They can invoke it using parl, which is like Perl, except it, it, it expects par packages. And par will find the script, run the script, 
using all the things inside the par file, which is great. If you need to add extra dependencies, you can do so like this. So here we've added the module IPC system simple. Even if we don't actually depend on it, or PAR can't work out that we depend on it, we can include it ourselves. If you want to create an entire directory tree that PAR can use and you want to just build it yourself, local lib, sorry, CPAN M has the switch local lib, local lib contained, which will actually build everything into everything that is not a core requirement when you install the module into a directory as specified. So for example, if you wanted to, to put Moose and all of its dependencies into a single directory, well, directory tree structure beneath this directory, you could do this and put Moose here. And everything that was not a core module would be installed there, even if you already had it on your system. So this would take a little longer than regularly installing Moose. But then you could pass that to par, package it up, and you'd have something. However, you may find, particularly in the case of Moose, that there are excess dependencies there. So you're then restricted again to architecture, operating system, version of Perl. Any questions? Yes? So when you use a par in your script, uh, does it unzip it every time it's using that script, or is there some sort of local cache? Or Par itself under the hood will uh, will either use a an archive tool to pull out the bit that it needs, which is essentially the same as unzipping, but it's not writing the unzipped version to the disk, or it will unzip it to memory and pull out the pieces it needs. Paul has further feedback. Can I correct you on that? Because I've done <laughs> way too much stuff in the past. Um, uh, it will, and as far as I know, under most circumstances, it will actually unzip it. Who asked the question? Who am I looking at? Awesome, cool. Um, if it's already unzipped it, it'll just reuse them. Um, and it's smart enough to realize that, hey, I've got a new version of the car file, therefore I need to update my local cache. So usually it will do so, um, and it will normally put it in your temp directory, wherever that is. If you have a system where you don't have right access to the, to the disk, that might cause some problems. Um, but I don't think I'd have to deal with how to get around that. For the purposes of the recording, the question was, when when par, when you use par, does it unzip the file for the par file for every invocation? And the answer was yes, and it will store it in your temp directory. And if you get a new version of par, it'll sorry, new a version of the par, it'll clear its cache and start again. Finally, there's one other cool thing that par can do, and this is how Sweeperbot works. Paul has created a Sweeperbot package that's just an executable. You can take this executable, double click on it, it'll go find Minesweeper, invoke it, and then start playing it over and over and over again until you need to turn your machine off. No, actually, he, he made it so that you could escape if you needed to actually do work occasionally. To do that, we can actually create so we can actually ask PAR to include a copy of the Perl interpreter slash compiler slash everything else, a copy of Perl with it. This is even more system dependent, dependent, but it can give you something that if you have a client who uses Windows and desperately wants that cool thing you did, you can go onto a similar version of Windows, create a par including Perl and give it to them and you don't have to say, oh, so go to Active State or Strawberry Perl, download Perl, do all of this, install these modules, install this other thing, install this other thing, and then have, here is my script. You can just give them an executable that they can double click on and it will work. Excellent. And there's further information on there that I'm not going to cover. Now, there was some exercises. Yes? Um, does it matter which Windows Perl you use when you do that? As in, does it matter? So the question is, does it matter which version of Perl you use on Windows? As in distribution. Distribution, so Active State or Strawberry Perl? Yes. No, it does not. So you had par pack your work with Active State? Yes. Yeah. OK. I've had problems, but I could just be. Um, um, I probably just have the compiler. And 
the make already installed, you go to the PBM, look for min, GW, and DMake, you add those in, now you can install them from uh, CPN uh, directly, and uh, you'll definitely be able to install power pack them. Okay. That, yeah, it certainly used to be the case that with, I'll just actually quickly say this one thing and then I'll come back to answering that. Please have a go at question two on the bottom of the page here. Now, to, to finish answering that question, it certainly used to be the case with Active State Pearl that it was terrible at having CPAN work. Like you couldn't just go to the DOS prompt and write CPAN and something and have it work. It didn't come with a C compiler and the CPAN shell they had wouldn't go, oh, you need a C compiler and go and fetch one for you. And so, yes, you had to go find the Ming GW libraries and install your own DMake and all of those kind of things. Right. In the last two, three years, possibly even a little longer, it's certainly not an issue as much anymore. It, it improved immensely after Strawberry Pearl came out that they updated their CPAN shell and now it does. If you just go to CPAN at the DOS prompt and you try to install something that needs access, it'll go, oh, you don't have these things, and it'll run off and install them your, for your, you straight away. And that will probably help a lot of these problems really um, immensely. Also, let me add one thing uh, that one of the dependencies for Firepacker on uh, Windows is Win32 EXE. I've had situations where installing that from CPAN has been a little bit of an issue. You go to your GPM to the Active State Secure Repository, it will be there. So that one you may need to get from Active State. Just a little uh, word of caution there. Yes. I used on the path, but the, the command is still not uh, <laughs> Let me have a look. <coughs> you might have to install our packer as well. Mm. Yes. RPT comes with our packer. What do you mean? I don't know. Well, you need to install our packer as well. Oh. <coughs> But PAR is not something you'd be using on your command line. Um, to do this exercise, mm -hmm. you would write a Perl script. Mm -hmm. So you'd be your favorite editor of Perl. <coughs> yeah, I have that. Yes? You need to write in your favorite editor of uh, e edit, uh, even text and uh, notepad or text pad, <laughs> you write a Perl program in. Uh, I use Eclipse. Uh, okay, we'll go open up Eclipse. Mm -hmm.
they come over and help the club in the stadium. Um, unzip, as I grab a copy and unzip oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I just assume people have windows on back, but that may actually be easy. You can get you to attend to it. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you some help to do the unzip. Okay, hopefully most of you have had some success in running this. So I've given you an answer file if you were really lazy. And it should have looked something like that. Use the name of my PAR, use my module. In this case, I'm asking you to get the hello subroutine and call the hello subroutine. So anyone who's, who, other than up the front here, anyone who's having difficulty accessing the tar zip that I made available. So everyone else is, has either succeeded with this, thought it was too boring, still working on it, or is otherwise okay with everything? Brilliant. Yes. Is it possible to change your background to white? It's difficult to see the text of the. Uh... No worries. I would love to change my background to white. As soon as I remember how. <laughs> it might be on the top. Yeah. Really? So there's this wonderful window manager I have that I hate with a passion, <laughs> but did not manage to get rid of before I started. Yes. So I do what? Right click on the, the terminal itself, not on the term, bar on the top. Yep. Okay, look, I'll... I've tried control, I've tried alt, I've tried shift. I will do that during the next exercise, but I'll promise to fix that as soon as I can. Very good question. I wish I could quickly just solve that, but it's going to take a moment, clearly. Okay, skipping on to the next chapter, auto die. As you should all know by now, Paul, are you still? I'm, I'm yep. Down. As you should all know by now, you should never call Perl's built-in things such as open and close and change dir and remove, uh, unlink and all of those things without checking their return values. Because in, in Perl, by default, most of the <coughs> built-in functions return false silently when they fail. It's like, yep, I failed, completely failed to do that. Are you checking? Ah, you didn't check. I'll carry on. Paul got kind of sick of this, and in particular, sick of explaining this to our students. So he wrote this, <laughs> he wrote this module, which he decided was um, a Klingon style programming in Perl. It is better to die than to return in failure. So typically, we would write code like this. Open my file name or die, can't open my file name. Except, of course, I'm sure you've seen people who've written open blah, 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 or dollar bang, or just completely forgotten the or. And I'm sure you've been bitten by bugs when you've forgotten to do the or die. <laughs> and this or die comes up all the time, and you end up writing way more code that is all or die this, or die that, or die this other thing throughout your code, then you actually end up writing code. So autodie allows you to escape this problem. You say, use autodie, and then you can go ahead and call most of Perl's built-ins, and it checks them for you. So you can say, open this file for reading, and it will just open it. If it does not succeed, it will autodie will make sure an exception is thrown for you. You can say, close this file handle. And if it does not succeed for whatever reason, and closing file handles can actually fail, 
it will throw an exception for you. Isn't that great? The bike shedding on coming up with the name Autodie? Oh my goodness. <laughs> it has a lexical scope. That means that it only exists in the smallest enclosing block or file. So if you say use Autodie at the top of your script, it's only affecting your script. It's not affecting the modules you use. It's not affecting the files you require. If you say use Autodie inside a subroutine, it's only affecting that subroutine. It's not leaking out and affecting everything, everything else in your script. So it has a lexical scope, which is hopefully what you'd expect. Wow, my indentation is really messed up here. My apologies for the messed up indentation. Okay, so here's an example. Subroutine, open or default. Read in my, uh, we get my file name. My file is this or some default, which preferably would come in in a constant. Use Autodie, open my file, return my file handle. Now in this subroutine, we're using Autodie so that open is going to fail with an exception rather than fail silently if there are problems. But the rest of the code is safe. So if you're dealing with legacy code that has lots of all dies or all warns or do this or do that, that's okay. You don't need to worry about it. You're using Autodie is not going to ruin everything. Autodie replaces Perl's built-in open. It replaces Perl's built-in chdo. It replaces all of them. So if you did have open or die my way of handling it, or just in fact open or my way of handling it, then Autodie will make sure that you never get to the my way of handling it. It doesn't look to see whether you've called it in a void context or not. It just replaces it with something that throws an exception. So your way of handling it will never be looked at. You can say no auto die. I want, you can say use auto die, some parts in your script, no auto die. I want to handle this myself. Here we're, we've said no auto die, we've opened and we're just throwing, calling die ourselves. Which gives us a chance to write our error message. If we don't say, um, a more useful situation here might actually be no auto die, try to do something which would normally, with Autodie, throw an exception, or handle it some other way. Perhaps we want to log it first. Perhaps we want to warn instead. Perhaps we don't actually want an exception thrown. We can also, so by default, just saying use Autodie turns Autodie on for most of Perl's built-in subroutines. We can just say turn it on for this one, but not all the rest, by being explicit. Use auto die just for open. But close, we will still have to check. I don't recommend this, because you'll probably forget to check something and introduce bugs into your code. OK, I'm going to get you to do a quick exercise in case. Is there anyone here who has used auto die before? Excellent, that's way less than half of you. Right, so for this exercise, write a program open, that opens a file for reading. Use Autodie. If, if you are new to, newish to Perl, you're here because you've just come and learned Perl this week, skip the ask a user for bit and just put in a file name. Open for reading this file that I've hard coded here. Good question. Thanks. So while people are working, I can tell you, Tar Factor has a really brilliant plug for the dash X, right? Which will actually run it. 
make sure that it really, really gets all the dependencies, which most of the time is the problem, but is a problem sometimes, particularly if you do a CK app. Mm. Yes, that's true. It's it's a very handy way to. Hooray! Very handy way to make sure that you can get the extra things that you need. That's yeah, that's bold enough. Just need to change my Vimasi Fana. How's that? Better? Much. I have a little, way more material that I wish to cover. Uh, if you have done this exercise, please raise your hand. Or you're happy enough to pretend that this exercise has been done, raise your hand. <laughs> okay. I'm going to continue. Okay, just a couple of things. Auto die throws an error exception object, which you can inspect. See, that, that area, that part of the chapter quickly collapses. Try tiny is a great way in which to use to catch these exceptions. It's an, an alternative to using block eval. I strongly recommend using try tiny because it actually spells try T-R-Y, which is the way it should be spelled. And there's an example here. Lots of stuff. Moving on to the next chapter. <laughs> As I said, 80 pages of material. Just can't do it. Even, I mean, in a day, maybe. <laughs> Not in 90 minutes. Okay. Building complex expressions. Who here has tried named captures using Perl 510s or betters regular expressions? Wow. Wow. Okay. Excellent. Who thinks that absolutely awesome? Yay! <laughs> Even if you haven't tried them. Okay, so the really, really simple stuff. Let's just get that back on track. That will do. Okay, the really simple stuff. Perl 510 introduced name captures. We stole them from a couple of other languages. Who had the original idea? I can't remember, but Python did actually have them first. I've had so many people like go out of their way to prove this to me. Yes, indeed, they got them first. So... Normally, we can capture things like this. So here, I want to capture zero or more, uh, one or more digits. Then I've put some sort of regular expression embedded in my regular expression or something, and then a few more digits. What ends up in my second set of parentheses? Dollar two. Uh, yes. What ends up in dollar two? Are they digits? No idea. Because if this has parentheses inside it, any number of parentheses, it'll be, it'll include dollar two and possibly dollar all the way up to ten. So how I know what the, what's inside here? N nothing that has been made easy for me. Perhaps the best way for me to fight to get to that would be to iterate over the the catch the match variables until I find one that is undefined and then go to the previous one. Maybe. My goodness, it's just hard work. In, since five ten, we can name our variables, our captures. We use this weird syntax here. Question mark, angle bracket, the name we want to use, close angle bracket. And then we can have our regular expression here, so we've got account and credit. And now it doesn't matter what goes in dollar one and dollar two and all of those other match variables, because we've got names associated with them. <laughs> and that's really neat. It allows us to build up regular expressions without fear of messing up which match variable we need. So here's the uh, um, here's a regular expression that will match someone's title. Very, very limited set. Mrs., Mr., Ms., Miss, and Doctor. Obviously, there are a lot more that we would put in here typically, but we're just going for easy. This matches the name. This Now we can use that to build a letter. 
idea, space, title, something. Maybe it's the top. Yes. Yeah. Space, name. So this will match dear Mr. Fenwick with or without a dot after the Mr. And it will capture the Mr. and the Fenwick together. And then we, we read the variable out of the hash called plus. Because this is Perl and we have to have variable names like that. So dollar plus curly brackets title, that gives us the value that went into title. Dollar plus name gives us the value that went into name. And we can add extra things in here. We can have, make these as complicated as we need, but everywhere we use dollar name regular expression in our code will actually use that name variable. Uh, we'll use the new regular expression. We can also capture multiple things into the same name. So here we've, we're using dollar account, which ha creates a named capture called account, and we're using it twice, account here and account there. So we're going to be capturing twice into the named capture account. If we capture multiple things, they go into the special hash called minus. And then that is, contains an array, so we can look up the zeroth position or the first position or however many we think we captured. Any questions about that? Isn't that awesome? It fixes back references. Instead of this slash two, we can say slash g position one, minus one. This slash two is problematic because if some regs, reg x sets has some parentheses inside it, we're now going to be referring to a previous match rather than the one that we think we're following here. Slash g allows us to say that reference over there. We can say slash g1, slash g2, or we could say the last one. We can use negative index indices. So that's kind of neat. Also solves the problems of is this actually an octal number versus is this actually a, a back reference. And then we get grammars. And grammars are almost completely awesome. And a little bit frustrating. So we can create a grammar. And what this does is it says, actually, we're going to create a whole bunch of named things that might refer to themselves. We're going to create this description of what our data might look like. And then we're going to work through it. So here's a grammar. We start that with open parentheses and we use, sorry, a question mark and then we use open parentheses rather than angle brackets. So this is a, and we say define. So we're defining a grammar here. And we're describing what an expression looks like. An expression, in this case, we're talking about a mathematical expression, something that you would use in maths and algebra. So x equals 5 or 5 minus 1 equals 4. But it would not be valid to say x equals with nothing on the right hand side or 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus. So they would be examples of, of things that will not match. And I'm not going to work out, show you how this actually all maps together because that's all covered step by step in here and you're going to come back and read it. But ultimately we can check that x equals 3 works and this regular expression will return true. Unfortunately, it won't return. Okay, so the, the term was this, and your op terms were that, and your identifiers were this. This is why it's only almost completely awesome. So, Damien Conway got really annoyed by this and created a module that hooks in deeply, deeply into how these regular expressions works and collects that information for you. And it's called regex grammars. So if you just want to say, does this look like this thing? The standard ones are great. If you need to say, does it look like this thing and what are its component parts? Regex grammars is great. Regex grammars also does the entire kitchen sink and the, and the house and the renovation and everything. But the really simple version just allows you to pull these things apart. And I had to go simple because I just could not keep wrapping my mind around all the rest of how it worked. And unfortunately, my indentation was really messed up again. But 
Anyway, if this was all nicely indented over a little bit more, but at least it's all in the same line. This is the same regular expression as I showed above with Re regex grammar syntax, which is slightly different because you have to say, this is a rule. These are rules. These are all rules. And then it gives you something like this. Ooh. It, it puts it in this great variable name. It's called, it's called uh, the hash called <laughs> forward slash. And then, of course, if you print it to data up, you go like, Dee! which I think is great. But, it, but you can pull it apart and you can find out all of your component parts, which is great. So use named catches. They are awesome. Hang on. I may have complete, completely skipped a chapter. Let's go back to chapter five. I don't quite know how I did that, but clearly I just skipped over too many pages before. Autobox. Who here has heard of Autobox? A few of you. Autobox allows us to have everything become a first class object. So typically in Perl, we only have really basic objects, uh, which are the ones we create with Moose or the ones we create as hash based or something else based objects that we did ourselves by creating constructors and doing all of that magic, which hopefully you never have to do in your lifetimes. <coughs> Autobox says, actually, no, everything's an object. So a string, a literal string, that's now an object. A number, that's now an object. A scalar, that's an object. Array, that's an object. And once everything's an object, you can give the methods. Now, Autobox itself assumes that you want to generate the methods all by yourself, all of the time. But we realized that, well, someone else, who wasn't me, <coughs> realized that that was actually probably not what you wanted. And they created a tool that allows that gives you a whole bunch of Perl built-ins as common object methods that you can have for free, which I'll show you in a moment. So here's here's another example of of, of why everything being an object is kind of cool. If you have a list of objects, you can say for each of my objects, if my object can serialize then call that method on that object. And this works beautifully if you have a bunch of objects. So for example, if you had three or four different types of objects and you've collected them all into a list, these are all of my musics. And some of them are OG file objects and some of them are MP3 file objects and some of them are web file objects. If I can call serialize on them, call serialize on them. That's what this code does. This code explodes and dies horribly if one of these things in add objects is actually a string. Because you can't call the universal method can on a string. Because it's just a string. Well, in this case, a scalar containing a string. But you can't call it because it doesn't have the ability to, to treat that as if it's a reference. If you just say use order box before this code, it works. Although that's a very simplistic use of order box and you're bringing in all of the order box magic just for that, that value. But it does work. Order box call, give, call gives you the awesome stuff. And this really is neat. And, and I'm delighted to see that Raphael intends to bring this in as a core module, even while he throws out as many core modules out of Perl as possible. So you may have written code like this in the past. We have to read it from the outside in. So we're splitting on spaces our string. And then we're reversing all of those words we got. And then we're joining all of those words we got with spaces. And then we're saying it. So this takes a string, splits it up into component words, reverses the words, just, just the words, and then joins them together with spaces. So if you had, I have a dog, you're going to get dog A have I. That's what it's going to do. Now, you probably haven't written exactly that code unless you've been to one of my training courses. With the auto box core, 
we don't have to read it inside out anymore. We can say take our string, split it on white space, reverse it, join it, say it. That's neat, right? In fact, because Autobox Core does a little neatness where it says if you are going to say something as a scalar, then of course, it's sorry, if we want to print or say a list, it will join it all together with spaces for us, just as if we had said say, uh, open double quotes at something. So we can omit the join entirely and just say string, uh, string, split, reverse, say. Yes? Does it use dollar double quote or dollar comma, or does it just always assume space? It always assumes space because dollar double quote and dollar comma are best not mentioned. Okay. <laughs> if you want something else, you can join it with, with that. So how neat's that? Like you could just write this thing that you can read from the left to the right without having to start work out where the starting point is. I love it. I think it is awesome. Now a common gotcha with the reverse function comes when people do this. I have a string. I want to reverse it, and then I want to say out the result. This is a context bug. Hands up if you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Reverse does this great thing. In a list context, reverse or reverses the order of the arguments it's given. So if you give it apple, banana, cherry, it returns you cherry, banana, apple. If you give it apple, banana, it gives you banana, apple. In a list context, it reverses the order of the arguments you've given it. You give it just apple, it's just going to give you back apple. Because apple, banana became banana, apple. Apple on its own, reverse with itself, it's apple. Say and print provide a list context because they can take a list of things. So when we do this, we're saying reverse, and here's one argument. That's that apple. So it gives you back that uh, argument, and it doesn't seem to do anything at all. But it does it really fast. <laughs> In a scalar context, reverse takes whatever it's given and reverses that as if it were a single string. If there's more than one argument, it joins them all together first and then reverses it, that is if it were a string. So 1, 2, 3, 4 would become 4, 3, 2, 1. And so that's why we have to do this to get that to work. But in Autobox, if, if it looks like we're dealing with a scalar because, hey, you know, there's a dollar sign outside here, it always calls on scalar context. So we can just say string goes to reverse goes to say. And we don't have to worry about this whole context thing, which is great. It also adds a bunch of extra stuff. So instead of just the stuff from, from Perlfunk, it, it adds other things. Like for numbers, there is is number, is positive, is negative, is integer, is decimal, and probably a few others. So you can say, if this value is a number. That's neat, right? There are extra things for strings, title case, center, and left and right trim, and a few others. So you can say, take the string and do this thing to it. Center it in this much space. And then with arrays, you get things like the sum and the mean and the variance and the set variance and the minimum and the maximum and the count. They've all been added for you as well. Some of them have been stolen from list util. Some of them have been written uh, on your behalf. And of course, you can string those together as well. You, if you've got two and down two, one goes to two five, will give you the list, will gener be in a generator for the list of one to five. Or 10 down to zero will, be, will generate the list 10 to zero. So you can actually say one goes to two five goes to Reverse goes to something else, goes to something else. Of course, you'd use down to, but you could string these things together without ever actually having to create an array that has these things in it and then do, do that work to it. So many fewer extra variables just hanging around the place. Might be a bit too much magic for some people. That's okay. You don't have to do this. And it also handles references. 
If you have an array reference, you can reverse that as if it were an array. And you can say that as if it were an array. And you will get the behavior you want rather than what you would get if you were doing this in regular Perl 5 stuff with that order box. Any questions about that? Awesome. Here's an exercise. Now, a lot of this stuff is based on the assumption that you're all relatively competent Perl programmers that can just go ahead and do this. If this seems too hard, just do little bits of it and play around with order box, because that's all I want you to do. The playing around with order box is way more important than actually doing what this exercise says. But if this exercise looks like something that is really easy for you to do, please have a go. Implement the basic guessing game. I have a number between 1 and 100. Can you guess what it is? I'll give you a hint. Don't change the guess between um, loops through this program. Otherwise, the people will never be able to guess it. It's like, is it 5? No, but I have a new number. Now can you guess what it is? <laughs> is it 10? No, nope, but I have a new number now. What is it? <laughs> Not going to help them very much. So without intending to embarrass anyone, my sample set of four of you, none of you are actually doing this exercise. <laughs> okay, we've got a couple. For, for you, don't look at the screen. You work on yours. I'm going to I'm going to start working on an answer on the on the board for the, for everyone else who is like, yeah, I could totally do that, but it's nine o'clock on Friday morning. <laughs> well, in this case, ten o'clock on Friday morning. I'll just like check my email. You work hard on the exercise.
Now, for those looking at the board, my answer here doesn't actually take much advantage of Autobox. There are a, a number of areas we could, but for the very, very basic game, I have not actually taken advantage of Autobox that much. So, absolutely things we could do. We could, for example, take, take my secret and treat it much more like a all of those things as objects rather than the functional style I've gone with there. But this is the basic game, and I'm sure you've all seen something much much like it before. I am taking advantage here. I'm being lazy and gone. I don't even need to, to work out what a number looks like because Autobox gives it to me. Because I haven't actually said use Autobox, so that would be a bad idea. I haven't tried running this yet. It, it does allow us to do comparisons for less than and greater than, but I'm not actually sure it's a good idea. And we're having a discussion about this during the party on the roof earlier this week. And I, the module also doesn't think that allowing you to do comparisons like that anymore uh, is necessarily a good idea either. But you could do it. So you could probably do, and I may get the syntax wrong here, but I believe it would look like, unless guess goes to M for maths, greater than MGT, zero goes to MLE, 100. And even then, I'd be a little bit dubious because I'm not 100% sure that they string together like that and then do ands, because maybe they string together and do ors, or maybe they don't make any sense at all. I guess that uh, it provides a chart method. Yes. But the, yes, there are a, quite a, a range of ways that you could do this. And it's a fun little program when we, when we get our students to do. But it's also a great way to start thinking about the ways that Autobox can make things a little bit easier. I mean, the, the is number is not a great solution here, which is why I said if you want to just play around with Autobox, feel free to do that as well. Any questions? Great. This one I just wrote? Yes. You wrote the entirety of the answer as one liner? Yeah. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so My main usage of it at the moment is here. Oh, okay, that says, if, is, if my guess looks like a number, so guess goes to is number, and it uses uh, is number or something similar to that from the scalar util module, which I could also do manually as well. Okay, now back to the practical exercise. Chapter 7. In your exercises directory, you'll find a climate data distribution directory which includes a whole bunch of, of climate modules. And this is a, this is a multi-part exercise that has you play around with a few of these things. And I apologize again for the formatting being weird. So sure, I, I was absolutely convinced that I had checked this. I'm feeling really, really um, foolish now. Now, what I first say is I say, have a go at using named captures to pull out this data. In theory, we would have just covered named captures now. Or you can use text CSV access. This stuff is a CSV file, after all. But named captures are not necessarily a terrible way of pulling out data like this, because then you can give the data meaning as you're working with it. So read through that. Don't worry too much if you don't want to do all of it. 
If, in fact, you don't want to do any of it, I've even given you an answer file that you can cheat and just look at that. But if you are going to try it, try it before looking at the answer file. And then on to part two. I don't think we're going to get through the, to the end of part two before we run out of time. So have a go, have a play. If you don't want to have too much of a play directly, then just start with the answers file. I'll pretend I didn't notice. Ten, fifty, thirty minutes. Should be okay. Also, I will not be upset in the slightest if you need to stand up and stretch and, you know, jog on the spot for a moment because I intended to break for some of the 10-minute break between the two, two sessions and somehow completely forgot to do so. It's not quite the same as completely forgetting to have a, a tea break for my students, which does occasionally happen as well. States now, you're going to have to explain what tea is. I, I think people may have worked that Well, it's coming back. It's sort of trendy right now. Tea is trendy. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, probably. They've <laughs> lost me now. But there are these really trendy like tea shops. Oh, yes, yes. In fact, there's one here, just a couple of blocks away.
If you're getting really, really stuck for the first uh, first two parts of the exercise, or first question one, it's going to look something like what I've got on the board here. We're opening our file, throwing away the first line, that's our header, reading in the first line of data, parsing it to get the year, the month, and the mean temperature, or we can use text CSV access if you'd prefer, and then creating an object. Question two has you doing something more interesting with this object rather than ending at this point and throwing it away. I will give you a little while to play with this before I move on to other things, just in case you do want to. Or we could move on to other things. Actually, I can take a poll. Who would like 20 minutes, five, some, some number of minutes we can work out in a moment to work on this? Who would rather talk about other things that are in this book? Goodness me. Must be Friday morning. I will be delighted to work on this with you later if you'd like. Okay, in which case I'll just go through the answer as it was. But you might need to block your ears. <laughs> okay, so the first, this exercise had you read in a month object, do some work with it, in this case actually read in the next 12, and then graph it. So I need to hit undo a couple more times. So here we go. Here are my months. For each of my months, 1 to 12, I'm going to get 12 of them. Read in the line, parse the line, create the, the relevant data into an object, and do that 12 times. Here, because I've used named captures, I can get the value out of the special hash called dollar plus, oh, sorry, percentage plus. So that's going to give me the, cap, the mean temp that I captured here and the year and the month. Any questions about that so far? Now, you could solve this par partially requiring you to read the documentation in my climate data module. So exercises, climate data, lib, climate month.pm. Ah. Full doc would be helpful. And that would tell you how to create a climate month object. This, the next part of the exercise says, now that you've created 12 of these things, graph them. And it says that climate graph can, um, is, it exists to make this easier for you. So here we're creating a climate graph object, giving it a title. This is actually wrong. We're only doing it for uh, one year. And then we're giving it a file name, labels. In this case, because we're, we're actually the data does not start in January. It starts in May. I'm giving it the labels from five to four, covering the, the month that this data actually applies to. And then we pass it in the values. And we can find out how to use that, again, by reading the documentation. 
So as you can see, create the graph object, plot it, and we can give it as many groups of values as we want. That will give us multiple lines on our data and on, on our graph. We run that, it goes, hey, you don't have the right module. How embarrassing. Clearly, I did not try to run that while I was um, check, testing everything. Meanwhile, the second exercise has you actually go, okay, doing that, creating month objects ourselves for every single piece of data will be really, really slow and pushing a lot of the burden of this coding onto the programmer who's using our module. Generally, we want our modules to, to relieve the programmer using our module of, of this kind of burden. So we actually created a module called Climate Data, which does a lot of this work for us. Climate Data allows you to say, I have this file, and I just want to be able to say, give me data from it, and it will create all the month objects itself, which is great. So hopefully this is finished now. Excellent. So if we have a look at that climate data, I'll just show that this works. I should do that. Should have a file. And if I look at fair, multi line, although actually there's only one line in this one. Look, climate data. It's awesome. <laughs> yep. Okay, so if we have a look at the documentation for. Climate data, it shows us that the work is, it, it need not be so hard. Oh, full doc, climate data, Lib. climate data. And it says, okay, so we create a new data object. We give it the file that we want to deal with for the mean information. We give it the location. And then we say, get month mean, and we give it a year and a month. What it does is it actually goes, opens that file and makes sure, and, and goes through that file until we get the month and the mean for that, that we've passed in. If the month and the year, I should say, the month and the year that we've passed in precedes the file, it returns an undefined value. If the month and the mean is later than the file, like sometime in the future, it's going to return an undefined value. Once we have got the first one, it assumes that all of our accesses are actually going to be forward into the future. It does not assume you're ever going to go, want to go back in time after you've created a data, or you've created, got one of these things. Because the typical usage would be to say, give me all of the, the temperatures from start of this year to the end of that year. Not I want this one, and then I want that one, and then that one. It's not actually optimized. In fact, it does not work for random access. Whether or not you view that as a bug depends on how you're using it. But that is not its purpose. So if we have a look at the answers for this one. Now, I've made this a little bit fancy. I've done it the way that I would like to see it done, not necessarily the way that you'd do it. So I've created a whole bunch of constants for things like the, how many months there are per year. And then I'm, I'm also allowing options to be passed in on the command line. So we can ignore all of that stuff and just pretend that that's already happened or somehow handled. And this is where we start actually doing the code that you'd be writing. So create my data object. It wants a mean file, that is, where to get the data from, and it wants to get a location. Then what I'm doing is I'm saying for the years that I've been asked for this data. So for example, from 1900 to 1905. For each of those years, get the make mean objects for each month 
in groups of 12 and store those in my data. And also, I'm just remembering what years I've gone through for my labels. Once I now have these objects all created, note that I don't need to do the parsing anymore. The module's done that for me. I create my object, I plot my graph, and I get pretty graphs. So we can run that. Uh, it's probably got decent enough defaults. And what we find is that it's really, really slow. Because the next exercise in this section is, my goodness, that is slow. What can we do to make it faster? And if we want, we can say, eh, mean graph. And then that's all the data that I just plotted. Isn't it pretty? You know all sorts of actual analysis on this data and look at outliers and all those kind of things. But we, we're not doing that today. So that was slow. That was slower than it needed to be, which brings us neatly into the next chapter, develop NYT prof. Who's heard of develop NYT prof? All of you. Who's used develop NYT prof? Fewer of you, and probably a few people are not paying attention. <laughs> okay. Devel NYT prof allows us to do wonderful, wonderful work in determining why our, our code is running at the speed it's running. Let's jump to the. I'm sure you know why you want a profile. Hey, the code is running too slow. To actually uh, do the profiling, it's really easy. It's just this command here. If, assuming you've got the module installed. So let's do that. On, what was that? It was climate data. PL. So here, we passed the D, the D switch. We've asked for NYT prof to be run over this, which means it's going to take even longer. So we'll have to sort of twiddle our thumbs a bit. But we will get some great information out. You can also, while we let that run, you can also export this into a environment variable if you want and then run your code. And that works as well. This allows you to change your profile a little bit more easily. But it's nice to know that you have these options. When you've run it, you'll get an nytprof.out file, which is not very exciting in its own right. Typically, we then convert it to a HTML, HTML file using nytprof HTML or some other format if you like. Because if you were wanting to actually do automated data mining on your information, HTML would be terrible. So there are other formats you can seek as well. Goodness me, we're still waiting. Maybe I should have done it over five years instead of whatever 50 or something it's set. If we say minus minus open, it'll actually attempt to open our browser for us once it has created that information so that we can walk through it. And it says a whole bunch of stuff. And then it's going to give us a table that would look sort of like this, but in much prettier HTML. Hopefully, I can show that to you. Is that actually on the command line? Sorry? Oh, okay. I, 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 I was thinking that might have been not on the command line. Should, yeah, maybe that was the problem. But we'll just give it a, uh, a smaller scope. Start year uh, equals 1872. End year equals 1872. It shouldn't be very, should be a lot faster. And yes, I, I know what you mean, and maybe that was the issue. Excellent. So now we should have our NYT prof out, as you can see. So we say NYT prof HTML. And it will just run through and do some processing. It's got a lot of out, gener output generation to do here. Meanwhile, 
So we'll get a graph that looks something like that. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to jump around our code and say, what is taking so long? <coughs> Which bit here is being ridiculously slow? And it does so incredibly effectively. So this should be only just a moment longer. Yep, I think this. Hey, look at your website, your web page. Here we go. So this is what it says. It says the top 15 subroutines that I called were these ones. Fatal, make fatal. I'm not using fatal, like directly. I probably don't have much control over fatal's make fatal subroutine, so we'll skip that one and move down. Frams validate, also something I'm not using directly and don't have a lot of control about. Date time locale, not sure, keep going down. Date time compare, params validate. Ah, climate data, that's something I use. Although not what I expected to see. Let's go have a look at what that is. No, that's not helpful. <coughs> you may need to look at the further ones. I know in advance what I'm looking for. I'm just a little bit surprised it didn't show up in this list. Yeah, well, that might be that, actually, because I only read it for three years. Now it's pulling up all 4,000 subroutines. If we go down here, we will find something that we control. And what we're looking for is actually get line. There we go. This will actually be the first thing that shows up if I had let it run for long enough. If we look at get line in particular, we look at this bit here. We'll find that the cost of creating date time new every single time we go through get line is, is our biggest bottleneck here. And we're actually creating it up here as well, although we're only creating 36 of these as opposed to 212 of these. So what's happening is we're creating a daytime object just so, if we look at the code, just so that we can compare and see if this is the date that we're, we want to be looking at right now. Creating daytime objects is expensive. Here I created a couple of hundred of them. If I was creating a couple of thousand of them, this would have just shown up as a massive time sink straight away. Fortunately, this is actually easy to fix. If we go back to our code. <clears throat> what we can do is we can say, well, actually, do we need to create all of these date time objects? We know what our year and our month is. We can, we can actually just do simple compares of those of our own accord without using all of these. And so then we'd end up doing something like this. We might move this inwards to down here. issues of creating code on two different um, machines. Or we could, we could then say something, for example, next if dollar year is less than, that's, so dollar year, if the year that we've got is less than the year that we want, don't even bother, don't even bother creating the daytime object. This will just mean that we glance at that and just keep going. And that will cut out a whole bunch of the, the objects that we were creating. We could then, if we, were, um, we wanted to be more fancy and cut out more of them directly ourselves without creating date time objects, we could say, well, if the years were the same, skip them if the months weren't. But we're only looking at an extra 12 maximum comparisons there, so we might not view that as being particularly valuable. So if we run this again, it should be faster now. So let's do uh, 100 years. 
I mean, it's still NYT prof. It's still going to take a while because it's got to, to do all of that data generation. But it should be faster overall. We can go back and have a look at that. Any questions about NYT prof? As you can see, it's really easy to use. And it, it gives us a chance of saying, oh, this subroutine, rather than having to guess, oh, well, you know, it could be that one over there. Maybe I should just optimize that one. So there you go. See, finish it on in, in much, much faster time. Of course, generating the, the HTML is still going to take a moment. I'll come back to that. Moving on. And there's a bunch of benchmarking stuff because benchmarking is cool as well. This, 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 in the benchmarking section, I've used, I've provided a comparison of whether it is faster to use grep to find something in a list versus to create a hash that contains all the things that you're looking for and then using exists. Also, all the things that are in the list, put those in a hash and then do a comparison. And you can and then walk over it with a for each list. There are different ways of, of solving the is this in that list for any random piece of data problem. There's two here. I think in the when I actually did this, I tried like five different ways of solving it. Benchmark is a great tool for saying what is the fastest solution for this problem set. Being aware that the fastest solution for a different even different set of data on a similar problem may be completely different. Okay. I got a couple of minutes left. Would you like questions or a very, very super quick view of Pearl Critic? Pearl Critic? Questions? Okay, super quick review of Pearl Critic. Pearl Critic is a great way of saying, oi, you've made a, you've made a, coding error, not as a bug necessarily, but as a, you have not done this right. And if you're one of the very few Perl programmers in your organization, or even one of the only Perl programmers in your organization, or you just don't want to bother your colleague to review your code every five minutes, Perl Critic is a great way of fixing those things first. So that then you can say, okay, I think the code is as good as I can write it. Pearl Critic's happy with my code. Will you review it? Pearl Critic's never going to say, that's a crazy algorithm. You should, you should be using quicksort rather than bubble sort. Pearl Critic's never going to be able to answer that question for you. But you should know, hopefully, that bubble sort is not the way to go. Pearl Critic is instead going to tell you things like, you're not using strict. You're not using warnings. You shouldn't use that pro that module. You should use this other one and all those kind of things. And it's really, really easy to use. So you say Perl, critic, and then you give it the code. So let's look at, run it over my climate data.pl that I wrote, that I showed you off before. It's, got a, it's going to have a few complaints, not maybe on the first level, but it will have a few complaints. So there. on the very, very gentle level, which is the default, it's like, yeah, you're fine. You're using strict and warnings and nothing's going terribly wrong. There are five levels of harshness that Perl Critic provides. And I have those up here. I've missed one. That's rather funny. So there's gentle, stern, harsh, cruel, and brutal. Brutal. That's when he gets really, really picky and says, you know, you're using double quotes, but you don't have any interpolation happening there. Shouldn't do that. You're like, I'm using double quotes because later I'm going to go and put interpolation there. Maybe. Possibly. Or you're using a string that has nothing but white space in it for split. Really, that should be a pattern. It gets really pedantic. So let's just bump this up a little. Let's go to harsh. In my opinion, if your code is passing harsh without any issues, or you don't care about the issues it's complaining about, then it's okay. So here it's complaining about the, the constant pragma. If you had a look, I was using use constant up here. No, no, it says you shouldn't use the constant programmer pragma. You should use read only. It would prefer read only is okay. 
If that's not enough information, I can say, give me more information. Verbose, equal, verbose or verbosity? Verbosity, I think. Verbosity equals 10. Nope, must be verbose. Uh. Something else that uses verbosity. And then, for every violation, unfortunately, even for the same violation again and again, it'll actually give, it, give me a f extra information. So here I can see which for, uh, policy I'm violating, and I can see what it would recommend I do instead. So instead of saying use constant foobar, it wants me to say use read only, and then read only my dollar foobar equals this. This has the advantage of it's a lexical uh, constant that I can specify whether it's a scalar or an array or a hash. Doesn't show that here, but I can actually do that. And a few other things. There's a lot of advantages to the, the constant pragma, including, of course, if, if it is a scalar, you can embed it inside a string. You don't have to come out of the string and then make it a con the, con the block style constant and so on, which is nice. But it is a little extra work, and I'm, use constant is the really lazy way of doing it, and I have been lazy in this code. If we want to see what it will do on Brutal, it will take a moment, but I'm sure it's going to be nitpicky about all sorts of extra things. Here we go. Actually, let's just get rid of the verbose so that we can see them a little bit better. Oh, that's, yeah, Brutal. Okay. So it's getting unhappy. Uh, my code is not tidy, which means I've, I've got some sort of Perl tidy violation. I've either used a tab somewhere or a six spaces instead of four or something like that. I'd have to check. I'm not using the RCS keywords. If that is, I'm, it doesn't look like I've obviously set this into some sort of version control. I happen to use Git that doesn't use RCS keywords. Normally, I would just turn these policies off, but I haven't. I don't have a version because I am not a module. I have a useless interpolation of a little string. I'm a bit surprised by that. I suspect it's not actually useless, but there you go. I've got new line at the end of a line. No, I've got white space before a new line at the end of the line. Yeah, it's, it's getting picky. So I've probably got like a semicolon and then a space before my new line. But it happens. So anyway, that's Perl Critic in a nutshell. You can turn off violation uh, policies. You can turn on policies. That's actually covered in the notes. Thank you very much. You've been an excellent audience. Mm -hmm.